Hey guys, Simon Esso here, and I'm super excited to be publicly releasing my Dimensions of Disclosure presentation on metaphysical activism. I believe that expanding our awareness into the subtle realms that have been occupied by nefarious influences is one of the major ways we can support humanity's great awakening. In this presentation, we dive into why this kind of expanded consciousness is a peaceful form of warfare we can enact, a direct means of taking this planet back. It's my passion to uncover metaphysical truths that support your personal journey. And that's why I'm excited to announce my new series, Worlds Within, launching on February 12th, only on edgeofwonder.tv. Season one is a deep dive into the metaphysical wisdom hidden within the world of warfare. We'll explore all the different forms of war fighting that surround us, from the subtle spiritual realms all the way to tanks and bombs. While it is obviously the source of great suffering, war is also a source of immense wisdom, maybe even one of the oldest in our galaxy. As we'll find out, becoming wise to the ways of war may be one of the most mature and disciplined approaches of becoming a source of peace on Earth. As Sun Tzu said, the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. I invite you to stick around after this presentation to catch the trailer for Season 1 of Worlds Within, The Metaphysics of Warfare. Also, if you follow the link in the description, you'll receive a 10% discount on an annual subscription to edgeofwonder.tv. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the presentation. And now, your MCs, Ben Chasteen and Rob Counts. Everyone who's in here should be very proud of yourself for getting up this early after partying as late as you did last night. We know you guys. Yeah. So we're going to be introducing Simon Essler, and honestly, this is the first time we actually met Simon is for this conference. We've talked to him quite a bit. We're all on like kind of this like live uh, this chat um, room chat that we always get on. So it was great meeting him in person, and I actually had a pretty long conversation with him the other day. He's a great guy, full of great energy, really positive, and he's going to present, and he is just going to have an awesome presentation for you guys. Yeah, and he's got a really interesting background, too. Simon is the founder of Thunderheart Guidance, a business that offers custom ceremonies for weddings and provides classes, workshops, and private consultation for guided meditation, personalized mindfulness, and curricula and kids, kids yoga, actually, which is pretty <laughs> awesome. Yeah, and he is a, an ordained metaphysical minister, certified kids yoga teacher, life cycle celebrant, and modern day personalized ceremony professional. Okay, so he's an early contributor and the creation for Full Disclosure Now movement and launched an online Facebook group, the QAnon Think Tank, an online space for filing, exploring, researching, and disseminating the QAnon disclosures. This group currently has 13K members, which is awesome, and I hear him wooing in the back. I think that was him. Simon, I know that was you. Right, so without further ado, let's bring up Simon. And... Thank you. Thanks, guys. Much appreciated. No hey, I have a shirt just like that. Oh, you got good taste. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you. Welcome to Saturday morning. Yeah, feels good. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. And I'm really excited to uh, share metaphysical activism with you. This is an idea that's been brewing in my heart and mind for a long time, so I'm really excited to share it with everyone. So today we're gonna to be looking into our multi-dimensionality and the subtle planes of existence. So some key questions I wanna start off with today. If free will governs our experience on this planet, how do we reconcile this with all the extraterrestrial and extra-dimensional influence on humanity's progression? How do we reconcile the fact that free will governs this earth with the fact that we live on a planet that tortures, enslaves, and murders children 
in startlingly large numbers. How is this our creation? How are we responsible for what is occurring right now? How can we learn from the forces that have used our free will to create the world in which we currently live, right? How have they usurped our free will, used it to their advantage? What metaphysical tactics have non-terrestrial influences utilized to steer humanity as a species? Through better understanding the metaphysics of free will, can we take more effective action in the world? Does understanding our history from a metaphysical perspective help us to take responsibility for this current situation? So, let's look at the definition of metaphysical. Frequency is the variable that defines something as physical or metaphysical. So what I mean by this is that our senses, they consider physical reality as a cross-section of frequencies within existence. So the physical is really just a set of frequencies that we're tuned into here on this plane of existence. So if something is metaphysical, it actually means it's an aspect of existence that vibrates beyond the common human sensory domain. And of course, activism is the use of direct, often confrontational actions such as a demonstration, a strike in opposition to or support for a cause. So we're gonna look at today at how these work together. So looking at the full disclosure community, this is really where uh, I found my path within this community, the push for full disclosure, the Full Disclosure Now uh, project. So together we really, really value community, unity, truth, forgiveness, sovereignty, integrity, and justice. This community is very, very powerfully focused on these values. We share the goals of mass awareness of hidden truths, the realization of humanity's true potential, justice for the oppressed, and karmic reconciliation for the oppressors. A lot of focus and energy in this community is constantly going into these goals. So when I look at metaphysical activism and full disclosure, what I want to push everyone towards today, where we want to end up after we go through this little journey together, is applying the use of subtle metaphysical planes of existence that give rise to this physical world that we're in to our advantage. This physical reality is a result of those subtle planes. So how can we take advantage of that fact? How can we establish a strong presence within the subtle realms? This is often what's happening in meditation when we're going into higher states of consciousness. We are bringing our presence to these subtle planes of existence. <clears throat> can we regularly and strategically connect to these subtle realms of existence to reestablish our divine awareness as a community? And can we align our goals and values with our full multi-dimensional presence as a community? You know, this planet, there's a lot of pressure to remain focused, habitually focused on this physical plane of existence. It's constantly beckoning our focus back. So it's very important that if we're looking to create change in the world, that we're coming from a multi-dimensional perspective. So then let's look into the metaphysical background of this existence, the metaphysical background that is operating right now, that's given rise to this experience that we're sharing. <clears throat> so this is a piano keyboard analogy of the human frequency spectrum. It's a really helpful way of looking into how these subtle planes of existence coexist, how we are existing within multiple planes of existence simultaneously through frequency. 
So this physical plane of existence, it's a specific octave of frequencies. But simultaneously, we exist within an etheric octave of frequencies, an astral octave of frequencies, a mental and causal octave of frequencies. So it's important to understand that when we're moving into higher states of consciousness, this is what we're accessing. So let's look at the etheric plane of existence. This is a plane of existence that harbors blueprints for your physical structures. They've actually done studies showing that the meridians, which is a connection to the etheric plane, form the human fetus and create the space between the organs very, very early in de development. So the etheric plane and the meridians form the human body before so much of the physical development of a human being. The etheric plane acts as a bridge between the physical and the astral and the mental realms. This really connects us to higher realms. So you have this etheric body that is constantly connecting you to these other planes of existence. And your etheric body is connected to your physical body via your chakras, via your meridians, via your breath. So this etheric plane of existence, it nourishes and guides the development of physical structures and it connects us, connects us to these higher planes of existence. The astral plane of existence. So many of you have probably heard about this, probably experienced some astral projection. This is often what we're experiencing in dream states that we have this astral body connected by a silver cord to our physical body, lets us travel. But this plane of existence is what houses the emotional and energetic information that is underlying your physical experience now. This is the plane of existence from which that information arises. The astral plane of existence carries an energetic and emotional imprint of what happens what has happened or what will happen in the physical sphere. So that's very important to remember, that it's spread out through time. The astral plane is not bound by linear time like this physical plane is. Also very important to understand is that subtle energy, like the energy that makes up this realm, it can linger longer than physical matter. And we've seen studies on this that there's a, a, a imprint, an energetic of imprint of, of you after you leave a room. And it moves quicker. This subtle energy, it moves more quickly, more effectively than energy in this physical plane. So these qualities are, are what allow us to sense this energy, this information outside of time and space. So when we're having moments of precognition, it's coming from this plane of existence. The mental or causal plane of existence. This is the world of possibility, potentiality, higher order. It's the recognition of universal patterns and connections. This is where we can access that kind of high level information but it can only be accessed, this plane of existence, this body of energy and information can only be accessed through our intuition and through direct knowledge, through directly experiencing this realm of existence, this aspect of ourselves. But this is also, most importantly, this is the realm, this is the plane of existence of the collective unconscious or conscious, these archetypes. So when we talk about humanity's collective consciousness, and when we talk about non-terrestrial races influencing humanity's collective progression, they're operating from these planes of existence. That's how information about the state of a collective consciousness is perceived. This is the plane of existence where that information is accessed. So then let's look 
at understanding the extraterrestrial and extra-dimensional interference that many of us have become familiar with through the testimony of Corey Good, of William Tompkins, many others. So some of the key revelations that I've distilled from the testimony of Corey Good is number one, we have been manipulated by a variety, a wide variety of non-terrestrial groups for thousands of years. They steer our development as a species to support their own agendas. And this is important to remember. Even some of the more positive uh, races and beings, they're still generally arriving with their own agenda. We can even say this on some level about the blue avians, whom Corey has explained uh, are trying to progress in their own spiritual path and to do so had to be of service to us. Number three, these competing non-terrestrial groups represent a spiritual and temporal war. This is super important to remember. When we talk about a spiritual war going on, that this is a spiritual war underway, it means it's a war that is operating on those subtle planes of existence first and foremost, and on this physical plane of existence in a secondary way. Very important to remember. It's a temporal war, meaning this is a struggle between groups that exist outside of time in the way that we know it, who are able to perceive time from a different perspective, move through time, travel through time engage each other in this temporal warfare with this struggle over controlling a timeline. Number four, as a species, we need to remove all interference and claim our sovereignty. And today, that's right. That's right. That's right. And today, our focus is how can we do that on those subtle planes of existence? Why is that important? What can we glean from all this interference so that we can get that sovereignty back, take this planet back in its full multi-dimensionality. Number five, they have used loopholes in cosmic laws that protect free will to influence us. This is talked about a lot. Corey's mentioned this and some of this has come up in the law of one material. That free will drives this experience here on this planet but there are ways that species with their own agendas can use the laws of free will to come here and enact their agendas. So then let's look at some of the basics of free will. And a lot of this I have distilled from the law of one work. This universe is the creator attempting to know itself. And so you, each of you, is the creator attempting to know itself. So therefore, all attempts at becoming more aware of ourselves and this reality are driven by this fundamental desire of the one self. That's what's powering this reality, this constant exploration of the one divine self. So then a group or individual encouraging new awareness of the creation in others by positive or negative means, well, that's considered in alignment with free will. If there's a planet that has yet to experience the vibration of fear and domination, well, a negative group of extraterrestrials coming and revealing that experience that's still the creator experiencing itself. That's still consciousness expanding into new realms of experience and existence. So that still works within the laws of free will. So let's look at the wisdom required to influence developing planetary populations. I mean, this is what these extraterrestrial groups are doing. This Earth is not their first go at it. I think they've been around, they have some experience. When we look at a group like the Draco, they've been doing this a long time, so what wisdom can we glean from their knowledge? They would have to have a complex understanding of planetary timelines and the key choice points within them. 
So timelines have these essential points that decide where things are going to go, right? that have more power over other points in time. They would have to have a perspective that allows them to perceive those points in a population's timeline. But also for individuals. Right? We each have our own separate timelines as well. They would need to be able to perceive that, to have that higher perspective. They're able to engage in temporal warfare. So they have this perspective, as I said, outside of time itself in the way that we know it. They would have to be intensely familiar with the rhythms of collective evolution that occur throughout cycles of time. And we all know about these cycles of time, right? The galactic cycles of time, the 26,000 year cycle. We have all these nested cycles of time, right? Planetary cycles, solar cycles, galactic cycles. They would have to be able to observe these cycles and insert their influence at the proper time in these cycles. They're highly aware of where a planetary population is going to be at a point in the timeline that they're influencing. So they're working with these natural rhythms. They have to, because that's another one of the ways they have to align with free will if they're going to influence a planetary population. They would have to have an advanced understanding of subtle or spiritual warfare, right? The ability to seed influence within the subtle planes of existence is a precedent for influencing the physical realm. So we look back again at this keyboard analogy. So the etheric, the astral, the mental. They have to be able to infiltrate these planes of existence first and foremost. Because free will is more malleable in the subtle realms than it is in the physical. Free will is strongest, is most protected in this physical realm. But when it comes to these other planes of existence, there's some more room for influence, especially because a planetary population such as ourselves, well, we lack full awareness of these realms of existence. We're waking up now, it's happening slowly. But when we're a species that isn't fully aware of these subtle planes of existence, then again, it is within the laws of free will to influence us in a way where we're forced to wake up to those realms of existence. That is the creator seeking to know itself. So any catalyst that wakes us up to the existence of these higher planes is permitted. They would have to have a refined comprehension of collective consciousness and unconsciousness. Right? The ways that planetary populations are vulnerable through lack of awareness or spiritual immaturity. And again, as I mentioned earlier, this is a point of view that is accessed through the mental causal planes of existence. This is where a species can view where humanity is at in its collective progression. That information is available within that plane of existence. So the kind of warfare they're engaged in, this is a necessary perspective. They would have to have a nuanced understanding of how karma scales up and down from the individual to the collective. It's this shared responsibility for the co-created planetary situation. And a situation that requires unity to be reconciled. So what I mean by this is, there has to be an understanding of how a population becomes trapped between the need for unity and the desire for separation. And this is really where humanity is caught right now. Unity is the only way forward. It is the only path that is going to reconcile this dilemma that humanity is in. But a desire for separation, for being enamored with the physical realm, is very strong on this planet. It's been encouraged very strongly. So a species often gets caught in this specific trap and they have to be able to identify it. If it's a negative group, they're looking to procure that kind of situation. Because when a planetary population is caught between the need, the true need for unity, 
but the very strong desire for separation, it can create a situation where the population just doesn't make a clear choice and they have to keep reincarnating. And this is often what the negative groups are seeking. They want the absence of a choice. They don't want to necessarily turn us onto their path. Just use us as an energy source. Have us keep cycling and cycling. So I want to look into some examples in our community. And this is a, a passage from Niara Isley's book, Facing the Shadow, Embracing the Light. It's a really, really beautiful, beautiful book. So let's look at this memory that she had of being a Lyran and her planet was engaged by reptilians. Let's see what we can glean. The strangers who came to our world were reptilian humanoids. They were very courteous at first. They asked if they might mine our world for some needed ores and minerals to save their own world. Over time, these visitors became more and more aggressive. We saw that they were not restricting their mining activities, and when confronted, these strangers killed several of our people. All around the entire planet, this act was sensed and felt. As a people, we experienced a terrible shock for the first time. It was the beginning of truly knowing fear. The experience of it had terrible energetic consequences. The energy of fear contracted and densified our vibration. We could no longer access the higher planes and dimensions. We had difficulty in moving about at the speed of thought as we once had. It required a tremendous, relaxed kind of focus that became very hard to achieve. A survival mindset was swiftly born in us out of absolute necessity. So as we can see, one of the primary goals of a race like this is to cut us off from these higher planes of existence. This is a key tactic. But we want to look at the moment before this group. If this is the Draco, if this is in fact the reptilians that we know, well, what had to happen before they made that physical contact? If we look at the laws of free will, well, they would have had to have assessed this planet's collective consciousness or unconsciousness first through the mental causal planes of existence. They would have had to assess where they are at. And so when they discovered the lack of experience this population had with fear, polarity in general, well, it revealed to this group, in this particular example, two tactical advantages. There were blind spots in this population's ability to make sense of and comprehend the spectrum of frequencies that make up fear and domination. So if we go back to these cosmic laws of free will, this is still a service, technically. They're helping this population expand by introducing them to frequencies that force them to expand and evolve perhaps more quickly than their natural evolution. This is often how a negative catalyst or negative influence is looked at. It sometimes creates a quickening. But the point is that this population had yet to experience those particular frequencies. And so, in service of the creator knowing itself, that influence was created. That's why free will allowed an event like that to happen. So let's look at the metaphysical agenda of some of these negative ET groups pre-contact, right? They would have to target planetary populations, like points in the planetary population's timeline, where they lack the spiritual maturity to live with awareness of these subtle realms. So remember, these species, they can look at a planetary population outside of time. They can see the timeline, and they can choose specific points in the timeline to insert their influence. So for example, post-cataclysm. We know that Earth has had many, many cycles of cataclysms, right? So if you're an, a negative extraterrestrial group choosing a point in time, coming right after a cataclysm is a pretty good opportunity. The big damaging physical events that occur, well, in terms of collective, collective awareness, it puts a planet into survival mode, draws them away from the subtle realms, just like Niara said in her book. And so the knowledge of these subtle realms, it falls into the collective unconscious, and an opening is presented for a race to insert itself. 
So the manipulation of a population from within these subtle realms acts as a catalyst because it forces a population to eventually reawaken their spiritual tools. And again, that's what's happening on Earth. We were cut off from these divine higher planes of existence, and now humanity is waking up to those again. Therefore, it's still within the laws of free will, because post-cataclysm, we already had lost a lot of that awareness. So the occupation of these negative groups forced us to start paying attention again to our full multidimensional nature. As we look at this plan of attack that a group like this might have, and here's the way it seems to work, that there's an agenda to influence and dominate these different octaves, these different planes of existence. And from that, the domination of the physical realm, it unfolds quite naturally. It's important to remember that it's like dominoes. Once enough influence and domination has occurred in these subtle realms of existence, it's very easy next step to take over the physical. So targeting the mental realms, these causal planes of existence, this is gives them access to the collective unconscious, right? So here's where they can insert subtle thought forms into a planetary population that then unfold over long periods of time that turn into self-imposed mental slavery, influencing a planetary population in such a way as to cause the people to trap themselves. When we look at something like reductionism, scientific reductionism, you know, this is a, a path, a line of thinking that has really, really cut us off from a lot and I'm going to go into that in a little more detail in a little bit. They would occupy and assess the local astral environment, meaning targeting individuals with a heightened sense of astral sensitivities, shamans, gurus, saints, and create, if they can, false religious experiences. There's the occupation of the etheric realm. So we know that there's the seeding of the etheric realm with vibrational anchors, right? People talk about archons, about AI thought loops and etheric technologies, entity attachments. This is the pollution, the purposeful pollution of the etheric plane of existence. And of course, because we're connected to the etheric plane of existence via our chakras and our meridians and our breath, then these kinds of influences, they tend to trickle down into the physical. They cause disease and illness. So William Tompkins, Navy SSP whistleblower, he revealed some very startling things. He made some pretty intense statements about the fact that all the educational institutions are based on false science, manipulated intellectual paths, all scientific institutions were based on distorted information. And that our society's overall understanding of reality is false because of this. But how is a manipulation on this level even possible? Well, if we go back to the idea of a timeline and a choice point on a timeline, then we can look at an example like the one I just mentioned earlier, of how we got to so much scientific reductionism, the Western scientific path of reducing the universe into smaller and smaller parts, constantly focusing on how the universe can be separated, and separated, and separated. Well, in the development of Western thought, there's two things, there's two choices that we had. There's monism and pluralism. And this is an example of long-term social engineering enacted by these groups. And monism is the closest approximation to the law of one that we can find in Western philosophy. The view that there is only one kind of ultimate substance. The view that reality is one unitary organic whole with no independent parts. So pluralism is the concept of the many. This is the antithesis to the law of one. And the history of Western 
scientific thought shows that pluralism was simply preferred. It wasn't proven, it wasn't studied and shown empirically that the universe is little bits instead of one big thing. So this was a bias that occurred in the development of Western thought. This is an example of a place in our timeline where just a little nudge in a specific direction would eventually put us in a position where we were very, very stuck. Because this bias of pluralism, of the idea that the universe is nothing but a bunch of little parts, it led to this process of scientific reductionism. It's one of the problems with Western medical care. Your body is just a bunch of parts trying to work together. It's not holistic. So this subtle nudge towards reductionism, the commitment to Western science, to pluralism and reductionism, it is this key choice point in our timeline. And manipulation on the scale that Tompkins is inferring and implying, it would require an expanded metaphysical perspective of these subtle planes of existence. They would have to be able to think long-term in influencing this planetary population. They would have to know how to see the collective thought form that will eventually expand and integrate over long periods of time. So if we imagine that there was an influence here to move us more towards pluralism and away from monism, away from a sense of unity, to do that early on and then to see, to be able to see that 200 years later, it's going to create the Western medical world and the Western scientific world as we now know it. The result is that hundreds of years later, we have this warped educational system, these warped scientific institutions. So this is some of what has to be inferred when Tompkins made this statement. It's the only way that things could get this stuck. And then, of course, once this warped system is in place, then you have some of the more physical manipulations of actively suppressing scientists, actively hiding technologies. But that occurs, again, as a secondary thing because the setup of our consciousness was we were put on a path of separation already. We were misled. So we are, in this society, perpetually being coerced into living the law of reductionism. We're pressured to constantly look at things in smaller and smaller parts to break everything into separate bits, meaning we're rejecting the law of one. Serious impact from a very small choice point in our timeline, something that seemed like a simple philosophical debate. It can unfold into something much more oppressive. But why manipulate humanity in this way? Increasing focus on the parts well, that, makes up the, that, that make up the physical plane, it shifted collective awareness away from the subtle planes and eventually created this attachment to the physical realm. So on Earth, pluralism and reductionism, it's this seemingly benign and innocuous philosophy. But when it pushed us more towards reductionism and more towards materialism, well, many generations you have a society obsessed with physical pleasure, with the physical world, and this is a place for Luciferians and Satanists to thrive. A spiritual path that is focused on the worship of the physical realm, physical pleasure, taking technology as far as possible with transhumanism. So by training human consciousness to become collectively fixated on the frequencies, right, on the octave that makes up this gross physical realm, then we collectively created a reality that through our free will requested blind spots in our perception. Our fixation on the physical realm is an act of free will saying we don't want to know about those physical planes. I want, or we don't want to know about those subtle planes. I want to focus on the physical. So because of cosmic laws, it makes more sense for a race like the Draco to use these subtle, long-term forms of manipulation to cause us to enslave ourselves. This makes much more sense than them looking to just kick in the door and dominate the planet. Because that's not going to work with free will. And it's frankly not as clever. Because they have the advantage of looking at humanity's progression over these long periods of time, they have the advantage of time travel and this perspective of our collective development. Well, why wouldn't they use that to advantage? 
because then a lot of what they're doing is very difficult to perceive. Some interesting examples of this from Pete Peterson. In a conversation with David Wilcock, he's talking about the way extraterrestrials came here and changed the counting base, our whole mathematics system. He says, the main thing they did was change the counting base, and that made all the sense in the world because you can do things with zero through five mathematics. You can do things with that that are totally different than anything you can do without that. And it's very subtle, but it's so totally important. It changes everything scientifically, everything. So again, a species with this kind of large overview, it just takes a subtle influence, and suddenly the whole civilization unfolds in a different way. We can't even begin to imagine maybe 1% of the things that a change of this mathematical base would make possible. It so totally changes our representational viewpoint of the universe. Every form of engineering we have will change. Things that we couldn't ever do will become instantaneously doable by children. It's a pretty bold statement. But these are the kinds of massive changes that can happen with a little subtle shift. So if you're a species that has awareness of these kinds of impacts, you just come and insert a subtle influence at the right point in the timeline. So this is a good way to understand this temporal war that's going on, right? Arriving at points in our timeline with these subtle influences and trying to steer our development in specific directions. Some of the recent disclosures from Corey Good are very revealing in terms of this topic. We live in this cluster, this cluster of 52 local stars. And there are other humanoid populations like us in this cluster that have been through their great awakening, through engaging and overcoming the Draco. Except for one civilization, he mentions, who was immune to the Draco's attacks. And Corey says this immunity came from the fact that they developed purely through consciousness, without physical technology, without intense manipulation of the physical realm. So this civilization's development it emphasized expanding into the subtle planes of existence, into these higher planes of existence as a priority over a material and technological progression. So, of course, in doing that, their free will was much more protected. They had full awareness of all these planes of existence, so there was no opportunity for a group like the Draco to come in and to influence things on that subtle plane to gain access to the physical plane. So we can learn from this, right? When we occupy these higher planes of existence as a community, as a collective, we're taking back that space. That's taking back free will. We have to consciously be present in these realms. So we look at this race that was immune. Well, you can see that the access wasn't there, right? These octaves, they were fully occupied by that species. The Casimir effect is a metaphor. So I'm not sure uh, how many of you know about the Casimir effect, but this, this was an experiment that was performed to try and prove that zero-point energy, that the energy of the vacuum, that the space around us existed. So they placed these two plates extremely, extremely close to each other, and then they measured whether the vacuum of space was pushing on these to get closer together. And they did measure they did find an actual force pressing them together. But I want to use this as a metaphor, right? This idea of these subtle forces on the outside. We can look at this. It's a good way to understand this negative influence within the subtle planes, right? If they're constantly influencing this, then physical life on Earth is struggling with the pressure of these negative influences. It means coming here and incarnating on the physical plane, you're swimming upstream. You're arriving on a planet where these subtle planes of existence are polluted. So there's this pressure. But conversely, it can go the other way. When we take back our power, when we take back our awareness of these planes of existence, then, then there's the pressure for a species to devolve, to evolve on a more positive timeline. So 
So, I did a little survey with some of the thought leaders in our community. I really wanted to look into what some of the people that, that we all look up to are doing in terms of metaphysical activism. How are some of the people in our community who are known for doing really great work in the disclosure movement, how are they combining this work of occupying the subtle planes, right? this work of higher consciousness with the work of researching and disseminating the real world work of getting the information out there, of understanding the truth and sharing that understanding. So this is, these are the questions that I asked in my survey. What specific spiritual practices surround your activism within the disclosure movement? For example, meditation, prayer, before and or after researching and creating content, sharing. Based on your experience, what kind of balance is created when the research and dissemination work is well supported by spiritual practices, when that balance is there? Number three, based on your experience, what imbalances arise when the research and dissemination work is not supported by spiritual practices? What happens? What kind of imbalances occur? Number four, do you have any personal examples of a time when your spiritual practices greatly improved your capacity to research, analyze, and disseminate the dense information that you work with? And how have your spiritual practices supported you in managing and digesting the research which reveals disturbing and sometimes traumatic truths? So I had a chance to talk to Ben Chastina of Edge of Wonder, got to engage Michael Sala about this information. I got to talk to Matthew Mornian about this information. So let's see what they had to say. Spiritual practices are very important in who I am and how I got to be what I'm doing. The result of maintaining these spiritual practices with the research and dissemination work is increased access to divine wisdom, which is felt while writing and researching. Right? They're working together don't want to get caught up in purely physical work. We need to hold that space, even when we're doing that kind of work. There's an increase in synchronicities. He said, ideas come to me faster, and things will be presented to us all the time, such as I will think, I wish I had a document that would help, and get an email very soon. After that, someone saying, hey, I found this document online. And this is really interesting because when we access these subtle planes of existence, when we fully become aware of them on a daily basis, synchronicity increases because synchronicity operates through the subtle planes of existence. I mean, how many of you had, have had a synchronicity that was precognitive? Right? It's pretty common, right? It stretches throughout time. Synchronicity operates effectively through these channels of existence. So when you become fully aware of them, that's one of the reasons synchronicity increases. Right? You're able to receive information and experience your existence more fully. So the regular use of spiritual texts, meditation, and exercise, they reestablish these subtle connections. And they remove some of the personal obstacles that can arise when researching and disseminating this disturbing material. And I really, uh, I really align with this, especially just regular reading and engaging of spiritual texts, of a text that really impacts you internally, every day connecting with some body of material. Very, very helpful. So on top of the regular spiritual practices, it's about infusing all the work with the refined intention to help others. And this does take work, right? In the process of red-pilling, of trying to awaken the people around us, we can sometimes get caught in our own desire to have it unfold in the way that we want, to have someone else's awakening unfold in the way that we think it should unfold. But that's not a refined intention to really help them. So working on really, really refining that. So when you're researching, when you're sharing, it's full of that desire to help in the way that people need to be helped as opposed to the way that you want to help them. When the metaphysical work isn't being done enough, what happens? Well, clearing the mind takes a lot longer. Ben says that writing can take longer, researching can take longer. 
So the spiritual practices, when they're in place, they generate efficiency in the physical world. Things move along more quickly with more alignment, more harmony in the physical world. Right? Speeds up your ability to get things done. Dr. Sala. So Dr. Sala's primary spiritual practice is surfing, which I think is so awesome. He says, immersion in the ocean and facing the inherent challenges it presents is restorative for my body and soul. And this is interesting because we can look at certain uh, natural spaces as access points to these higher realms of existence. Connecting with the natural world is like opening a gate or clearing blockages to these planes of existence. Balance in terms of spiritual practices and research is everything. Without it, one loses objectivity when overcoming the challenges inherent in finding the truth. Very important. We, to maintain objectivity, we have to maintain our connection to these higher planes of existence. When spiritual practices are not present to balance the work, well, that's when we lose that objectivity. And this is when fanaticism either for or against experiencers and researchers occur. And we see this all the time in our community, right? People who are fanatics about someone to a point of imbalance or people who are devoutly against someone and spend all their time on the internet just trolling and harassing one person. This is one of the imbalances that occurs when someone does not have their connection with those planes operating in the way that needs to be. When troubling questions arise in the research, it's often immersion in the ocean that brings the answers. I like this. I like this because I'm a big fan of Dr. Sala's work. You know, I, read, I read his books. I listen to the audio books. I go, I go back to these texts again and again. And it's very interesting in going through this material to think that the ocean had a really big part in the creation of these books. It seems to clear away obstacles to finding answers to burning questions. Questions that are just really, really, you know, burning inside. Sometimes the answers arise because immersion in the ocean clears the space for it, opens us back up to this fully expanded sense of existence. There are many negative entities that attach themselves when one is researching the truth about secret space programs, extraterrestrial life, and corrupt elites. Regular immersion in the ocean clears away all the traumas and disturbances I encounter in my research. This is also really important because as a community, we're all constantly engaging this material, which means we're targeted, right? In the etheric realms of existence, there are entities that are sent or that arrive because there's a strong desire to stop this information from coming out. And that can happen, this can happen, because, as I said, there has been an, an, a negative occupation of these realms, right? They've been dominating these realms for a long time, so that when something happens on the physical plane they don't like, they can respond in the etheric plane or in the astral plane. Matthew Mornian, beautiful man. So his practices to retain this subtle connection are meditation, qigong, and breath work. And when research and dissemination are balanced by spiritual practices, he explained that it assists in allowing for a greater level of discernment in understanding the frequency of truth in all things. And this is very interesting, going back to that, the analogy of the the spectrum of human frequencies on that keyboard, right? And somewhere in there, we can really feel the actual resonance of truth. Very subtle, right? We have to learn to become subtle so we can become an antenna for that. But it does seem to have a frequency. It is one of the ways that we can discern what's going on. But when these practices are not in place as we're doing this work, the results can be emotional toxicity, mental toxicity, ego distortions. And that can really slow down our work. As activists, for full disclosure, it can really slow us down to get caught up in these places. Awareness of the subtle realms and the way we are interacting with them. 
this plays a key role in understanding the frequency of truth, right? Developing a relationship with these realms of existence, with these aspects of yourself, this is what gets you to that place where you can start to really feel out and get familiar with what truth feels like in your body, how truth presents itself to you in resonance, in vibration. This has acted as a guiding light on his path. When disseminating information to the community based on his own research, he tends to run information through a filter to see how it stands up energetically. And I really, really like this, and I really, really resonate with this, right? When you encounter some information, you can sit with it, right? Really let it come into your being. Information is alive. It's surrounded by energy and implications and potentiality. So when you are encountering new information, if you're moving through research, if you're trying to share something, you really want to feel out how it stands up energetically. But the only way to do that is to be practicing your presence in these subtle planes of existence on a regular basis so that when you encounter a piece of information in the physical world, you see how it's resonating in those other realms. It becomes clear to you. So on his journey, discernment has become about frequency. Constantly testing the frequency of what feels true or not. So this can be often about whether something resonates as dead or alive, organic or inorganic. Very important in, in sensing out if something is an artificial intelligence influence, right? I know that this is a realm that he works within a lot. So again, there's... there's information about this presence that has its own frequency, that can become familiar to each of us if we work to develop those sensitivities. On developing discernment. Well, we each develop our own systems of discernment, and this is based primarily on the level to which we know ourselves first. This is very, very wise words from Matthew. Because self-awareness is really how discernment arises for us. Right? And I would say that in the view of what we've talked about today, that self-awareness, a big part of it is becoming aware of yourself in these other planes of existence. Right? Becoming really truly aware of the feeling of your chakras as they're connecting to the etheric plane of existence and how your meridians are constantly connected to the etheric plane of existence. You're constantly connected to this. So developing that self-awareness, that multi-dimensional self-awareness, that leads to your own systems of discernment. As we can see, each of these different individuals in our community, they have very unique approaches to discernment, to research, to dissemination, balanced by their own spiritual practices that they discovered authentically on their own path. And so today, I'm not really here to encourage a specific belief system, or a specific set of practices, as you can see, it's really about authenticity. But the through line is that we need to move into those different planes of existence. So of course, meditation, different kinds of meditation is a great way to do this. As a community, mass meditation is a really excellent tactical way to occupy these planes of existence. Metaphysical activism and full disclosure. So let's come back to this now. Right? The use of the subtle metaphysical planes that give rise to our physical world to our advantage. In this work of researching, disseminating, sharing, red pilling, trying to help other people, trying to support their path, using these planes. But that means establishing a strong personal presence in these planes of existence regularly and strategically connecting to these subtle realms to reestablish our divine awareness. And this is, it's important to remember that we're doing this not just to become calmer, clearer people, but because humanity needs to occupy these spaces again. So, I want you to know that you can stay in touch with me, follow me on Facebook. I'm going to take some questions soon. In fact, we can start setting that up right now. 
Does anyone have uh, any questions they want to ask? Hi there. Yeah. My What's question? your name? Rolando from Los Angeles. Pleasure to meet you. Yeah. Pleasure to meet you too. Thank you for coming. Very good. Uh, even when we have the feeling that we advance, you know, the communities advance, um, I still see so many people, even instead of see less on less, we have about 55,000 yes in LA alone. And this population is increasing. When I go over there, I feel so bad, you know. Mm. That these people have to live, a lot of young people have to live in the street. Uh, and at the same time, I heard that we're growing as a species, that we become aware of these facts. Um, how can this big conscience that we have behind everything, it doesn't enforce this um, free will thing? It's not that the people want to be in the street. Mm -hmm. It's this, it's designed, you know, to be that way. And it's increasing that population rather than diminish. So how you can compile this with the conscience that at the same time we evolve certainly and at, in the other way, you know, we have so many more and more and more too much suffering in the planet. So how, you're asking how I can reconcile all the, the current suffering with this idea of free will? Yeah, at, yeah. Uh, at the same time that we evolve some group. Yes. It's increased in the other side too, you know, so many yes. people come less and we see the suffering around us and yes. hurt us too. It's an excellent question. It's an excellent question. So uh, one of the things that's important to understand about free will is that when we incarnate on a planet such as this, well, that's, that's part of our soul's free will here on earth. So when you choose to incarnate on earth, you are uh, engaging in a contract that agrees to experience this planet's situation at this point in time. And so it's free will, but within the confines of the choice you have made to incarnate here. So when we look at groups of beings that are suffering terribly on this planet, there's still there is a lot going on that's very, very difficult and very violent. It's important to understand that there is a choice being made to arrive here. And that free will is unfolding, but within the confines of the soul's choice to be here. And it's sometimes difficult to reconcile when we see people really, really struggling and some of the awful things that are going on here. But um, to be of service to this planet, you know, to come here to struggle with uh, the things that are so stuck, uh, it's a very powerful choice. And so I think the best we can do as individuals is to really evolve and expand and recognize that when we do that, because we are all connect connected, we are making it lighter for the people who are suffering, for the people who are at the bottom. There is an impact going on there, but we also want to respect that their choice to be here, to live that incarnation, is an aspect of their free will as well. Hope that makes sense. Thank you. Hi there. What's your name? Hi, Simon. I'm Shelly. We've connected Hi. online. Nice Hi, to meet Shelley. you. Hi, uh, Shelly. The presentation, I think, was just really absolutely brilliant. Um, I think that in the way that narratives have been created for this community by David Wilcock and by Dr. Sala, you have done another um, on that model of connecting a narrative that we all um, can benefit from. So I really, really, really thank you. Thank you. And yeah, I just want to know if you want to write a book about that because that was brilliant. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Hello. Hi, I'm Laura. Hi, Laura. First, I think that Ben and Rob should have you on their show. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, kind of to follow up with the first question, I've heard that some souls are almost forced to reincarnate. Mm -hmm. Have you heard this? And hmm. do you believe it? Well, I have heard things like that. I have heard things like that. Uh, my understanding of that is that uh, it's connected to the actual maturity of a soul. That souls, just like people who are incarnate, they, they, they are reaching higher and higher levels of awareness of their existence. So when a soul is 
less mature and less developed, it is a little bit more at the whims, uh, you know, at the, it's, it's influenced by the whims of its own karma. So it's more like a soul that uh, doesn't have as much conscious development is going to be at the whims of its karma. So it's going to be a sort of moved along uh, until it wakes up to its full existence. So that might end up being a situation where because this soul lacks a certain amount of awareness, there are negative entities sort of pushing it in a certain direction. And that's much like what we talked about today, right? That um, when there's a lack of awareness, that becomes a space for negative beings to occupy. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Great. Hello. Good morning, Simon. I'm Joanne. Hi, Joanne. You now have a new fan. Thank you. Woohoo! Um, <laughs> <laughs> My question for you is, could you please expand further on Pete Peterson's zero to five mathematics and how a 1% change on that could have thoroughly affected our evolution? I lack the sufficient background to understand what you're referencing. Absolutely. So uh, I believe the conversation that they were talking about, it was specifically in reference to the number of fingers we have and that there was a manipulation of how many fingers we have, and that was the way in which they were looking to manipulate the base mathematics that occur on this planet. So that a species who just has three fingers, right, they develop a different base mathematics that seems to be the pattern. So Pete and David Wilcock were talking about that specific manipulation and the ways that uh, creating a different physical body would then lead to a different mathematical system, which then leads to a whole different civilization. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Mm -hmm. How you doing, Simon? I'm very well. Wow. What an incredible, comp uh, just it complimented everything that I was waiting for. Uh, there was that small part, that little aspect of victimhood <laughs> had been erased based on just what I saw there. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, my pleasure. Let's get rid of the victimhood. Let's get yeah, it out of it here. Because, <laughs> you know, before I was like, oh, I'm going to ask this question. I'm like, God, it just seems like if I, when you go to the higher space, the question is not even important. <laughs> we, we keep draw, you know, I keep seem to drop down and I'm like, hmm. I, I want these royals to, you know, go down. But it's just, it's just the system. It's That's just, right. But it's. Not fun, but it's a beautiful thing. It um, is indeed. Thank you. Yes, you do have another follow. But um, do you think um, with uh, what's happening now and, you know, with uh, Fulford, you know, coming forward, he's stating he's identified, you know, these families and these 13 families. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it just seems like, you know, we're having a hard time just to get rid of the low, low level people. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that we might get to those 13 families? Uh, you know, do you think it's even possible to I do. get to them? I do. I do believe it's possible. But I think it is important to understand that the spiritual path that those that the people in those bloodlines are walking, it's based on continuing their violence, their commitment to this negativity until the bitter end, right? The, the spiritual orientation that they exist within, it's about going until, uh, I think Corey says he's heard them say, a quick, a, a quick stop and a sudden drop, basically meaning that we'll do it until we're hung. Uh, there are specific beliefs that they have that have to do with committing to the very end as an act of devotion. And some, some of them believe that if they do this right until that final moment of punishment, that uh, one of the, 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 the demonic entities that they worship will come in and influence the situation if they take it right to that last moment. So that's one of the beliefs that some of these people have. So I do believe justice will come, but we are, we are stuck with the, the very rigid belief system that they operate within. Hi. Hi, Simon. My name is uh, Matthew or Matthias. I wanted to ask you, um, I'm not clear about your presentation on one point. I agree with you know, most of everything. Um, I wanted to know the Dracos, you're stating that they are not influencing our free will or they are? They are using the parts of us that lack awareness to steer our free will in a certain direction. Free will 
in an individual, let's say, is not fully activated until that individual is aware of the full spectrum of their being. Right? How can we operate free will in realms we don't fully understand or live within? So, in the physical realm, our free will is the strongest, right? That's why, uh, you know, one of them isn't going to kick in the door and, you know, punch me in the face for my presentation. You know, it's not, uh, not going to happen because uh, where we lack awareness is where our free will isn't very strong because we haven't brought it there through our consciousness. So this creates an opportunity for these beings to come into the spaces where we lack awareness and in uh, influencing us and disturbing us in that area, it acts as a catalyst that wakes us up to those parts of ourselves. So it's seen as in alignment with free will because the end result is that we, we realize, oh my gosh, I, I exist on multiple planes and I've, I'm being interfered with by these beings. But it was their interference that brought my awareness to it. So because of that, it's still in alignment with free will, with our free will. So the way to take our free will fully back is to become fully aware of our, our entire spectrum of existence. Does that make sense? Um, well, I, I find that hard to reconcile with, mm. with, with uh, women and children and people who are bond, who are waking up or basically getting blown away in their sleep or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, where's the free will there? I mean, I don't... Again, I so... It I w no, it's very difficult to reconcile. This is a very, very hard aspect of this to reconcile. It's very difficult because... There's a couple things that could be happening in a situation where there's like a child, you know, women and children who are engaged in immense suffering. It, the, there could be that this is a very, very advanced soul that has agreed to a very difficult incarnation because this soul is so devoted to service to others. So that can be one of the things that's going on. There's, in Buddhism, they talk about the bodhisattva vow, which is, I will not, I will not ascend, I will not move up until all other beings come with me. I will keep working endlessly until all the other beings ascend with me. So it could be in some of those situations that we have very advanced beings agreeing to these difficult incarnations, but it could also be a soul who uh, is lacking, again, lacking a certain uh, maturity and awareness of their existence, and so in their own karma that they have accumulated, they end up in a situation where they're being forced to understand their existence in the ways that they have yet to comprehend. And um, again, it's like there's a, there's a bit of an impersonal thing going on with the way that negative and positive catalysts influence our progression. Um, because the negative influences on us, the really violent, intense influences, they can often create a faster spiritual progression. So you may come to a planet and engage in great, great suffering, but it could advance you much more quickly than arriving on like a paradise planet where everything is peaceful and easy. So there's a bit of a contrast there in terms of uh, how populations and individuals develop. So it goes back to that soul and whether that soul has made it as a fully conscious choice or whether that soul is at the whims of their own karma and is being encouraged to wake up. Mm. Okay, I just wanted to bring up one more thing. Sure. Um, this, this goes back, this point goes back to uh, Mike Waskowski yesterday with his presentation mm -hmm. saying that wars are needed for growth, yeah. etc. Mm -hmm. um, and that may be true if you're looking at a, a multi-generational a process where people reincarnate, mm. but then, in my opinion, uh, when there's a war being waged and there's a lot of innocent people in the middle who get caught in the crossfire, uh, yeah, if you take the multi-generational perspective and say, well, they're just going to reincarnate and everything will be fine, well, but at the moment, they're being killed, uh, they're still sort of caught in a crossfire, so yeah, I mm. mean... I see the bigger picture, but I, you know, I'm not quite sure if that's entirely, you know, true. Yes. Or just what you say. And what Absolutely. And you know, I come from this perspective because of my own direct spiritual experiences, my own understanding of my path. So, um, you know, I think. 
These higher perspectives are not meant to make us just feel okay about the level of suffering on this planet. It's painful, it hurts, because we're connected to every being that goes through that. So they're not meant to um, disengage us from compassion or concern, um, but it is, it is my understanding that that is the case. But if, if it doesn't resonate, if what I'm saying doesn't resonate, drop it. Absolutely. That is the only authentic way forward. And find what resonates for you. Hello. Hi. Hi. You are my synchronistic event today. Wow. And, and I want you to know that. Thank you. Wow. Thanks. <laughs> Coming to this event, and again this morning, I fervently prayed because there was a couple of things I needed to know. Um, the work that I've been given to do is always... Uh, finding the agreements that we made, the choices we've made, and allowing, mm. facilitating people to break these yeah. and to fully align with their divine self. Yeah. But I'm always looking deeper, 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 what was the agreement we made at the deepest level that has subjected us all to, the, to what's going on? Yes. And your presentation was absolutely brilliant. From your first questions, it's the, it's the questions I'm asking mm. because... I'm always being shown how to take everything to a deeper level and put it into my process. Yes. Now, the, I do have a question because um, mostly what I do is allow people to make a choice here to take all of their bodies and align fully with what they are. It's, yes. it's coming into wholeness. But I've also been talking on a soul level um, I'll go talk to everybody that's going through these horrific things and invite them to break those agreements. Do you, from what your, your experience is, do you think it's possible for this, on a soul level, for someone to make a conscious choice that completely, um, you know, comes down into the physical? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Especially if the, if the soul is advanced enough to have that understanding, right? Um, there's a you know, there's a level at which uh, a soul becomes aware of itself more fully, and I think uh, you know when we look at a community like this that is engaged in the level of awareness that we have. So to be incarnate on Earth, but to be aware of reincarnation, to be incarnate on Earth, but to be aware that we're a soul, um, that normally, in my experience, signifies that uh, someone has developed soul awareness that allows them to make those kinds of choices. Um, does that make sense? Yes. And, and I'm sorry, I'm going to... Go just, ahead. Go ahead. Well, because what I've been shown is like um, the abuser and the victim mm. have an, some sort of agreement. Like the universe is harmonious. Yes. So they find the right person to heal the wound that they're carrying. Absolutely. And when they, when they break that agreement, both sides are free. It actually unravels the karma. Yes. Do you think that's possible? You mean uh, uh, an abuser and an abused deciding to break the agreement to move through that karma together? Um, well, my understanding is that the, the way that would happen would be through forgiveness. Well, w uh, I totally agree. Mm. Um, but when they break the agreement, either side could break the agreement and both sides are free, one from the effects and one from carrying the karma. It mm -hmm. basically unravels it. So it mm -hmm. kind of goes beyond forgiveness. Mm. Um, it, you mean awareness of that contract and through awareness of the contract making it null and void. Is that yes. what you're saying? Yes. yes, yes, absolutely. Conscious awareness, especially if it's two souls operating on that level, I do believe that can happen because any, any time we expand into greater awareness, then our choices expand as well. Um, so I think if, if two souls arrive at a higher perspective, um, then they would be given extra choices, more choices to change their paths together, absolutely. Right, because if we can go beyond the belief that karma is a necessity, yes, oh, like that'll change things. Yes, absolutely, I agree, absolutely. Thank you. My pleasure. Hi, hey, Simon. What's up, Chuck? Oh, you know, um, well, you spoke a little bit about the, you know, the Draco and the, and the kind of tactics, you know, like a fourth D negative race might do, you know, that they go through time and sabotage things and stuff. And, uh, yeah. And I've seen a lot of evidence for, like, giant trees and stuff. You know, like, you look at uh, Devil's yeah. Tower, right? It looks like, and I just wonder what you thought about that, you know, because it, it kind of showed us on Avatar, you know, that, that tactic, you know, and, and I, 
There, yes. There used to be giant trees that were miles high and stuff, man. I, I definitely could say something about that. So my, uh, I do a lot of work meditating and connecting with trees, actually. And I really have found personally that they are like a gateway into these subtle realms of existence. I really... I really feel that they, uh, they offer access points, sort of in the way that Sala talks about the ocean, is that uh, engaging with these beings can bring us into a better understanding of our multidimensional selves. And I believe that the Earth, when it um, had these gigantic trees, that they were like keepers of, of knowledge and wisdom, and they were these immense access points. So again, if the game was to try to remove our access to these subtle realms, then these energetic pillars across the planet that were resonating and creating this access, it would have been very strategic to have them removed and to encourage uh, you know, their, their destruction. Yeah. Hi, Simon. Hi. My name is Kavern, and uh, I just wanted to thank you so much for your uh, disclosure this day because Thanks. you moved me to tears. Oh. I felt like you were my older brother taking care of a younger brother, and I just wanted to let you know I really, thank really you. appreciate thank you. what you've done. That really thank means a lot. Much. Thank you. Good morning, Simon. Thanks morning. for taking the time to be with us and teaching us. Sure. Uh, my question here is, um, this free will aspect, um, with the belief systems in our world, and there are a few of them, uh, <laughs> um, how, is it, how is it that the free... Keep your uh, mouth really close to the mic. Oh, sorry. How is it... I'm trying to understand, and I understand the free will aspect of it, but if we, uh, with our free will... Mm. Um, are being dumbed down, uh, ongoing, and it seems to be the case. How can we have um, other arsenals in our toolbox in order to get out of it if we only have one option? What do you mean only one option? Which option are you speaking okay, to? Let's take um, the beliefs of, of the people on earth mm -hmm. with the places they go to to worship. Okay. They only believe in one and right. they are stuck with it yes. um, to death. Mm. Now, this is a Luciferian um, community, we can say, possibly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, with that limited knowledge that we have, and when we pass, and we know that this Luciferian uh, community is there standing by, knowing that you were raised with that belief, and they're there to um, accept you, or guide you afterwards, and you only know the one, and then when you re reincarnate here on earth, because the only option we understand is one, which is here on earth, and there are many planets, and we know that. Um, and when we come back, they dumb us down, whether it be with the food or lack of nutrition, mm -hmm. uh, again with the beliefs, or just constantly beating you down. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, the free will aspect for me is a little bit difficult to understand if you don't have the options. And right now, we as Earth, we have the option to say that these are the facts, the belief systems or the places we go to worship are an aspect or um, how can I say, an option, but there are many other options. This we know today, and yet we still continue this. We allow this to continue, mm -hmm. which tells me there's a, still a greater force here in place. In my mind, this force should be taken down so we can have a better perspective on what reality is. We can't limit our options and say it's free will, because mm -hmm. our free will or their free will or who, who anyone's free will requires options. Without those options, you have no other place to go. Yeah, I understand what you're saying now. Uh, okay, so there's one way to look at this that, that I've found very helpful. There's, um, there's something called operant conditioning in behavioral sciences. And operant conditioning is the notion that human beings need an external operant to know how to behave on earth, to know how to live their lives. The notion in operant conditioning is that human beings can't function unless they have some outer manipulation going on. 
Now, in my studies, this is extremely pervasive. It's a very, very strong, deeply held belief system that has been installed here on earth. So because there's this deep uh, sense that you cannot live your life without outside control, and this is, you know, this comes from the educational system, the legal system, the financial system, they all operate with this idea that you need to be managed then uh, because that is uh, so stuck on this planet, then the majority of the people on the planet are, are genuinely seeking external changes that then give them permission to make the internal changes that are necessary. So when a mass of beings, when a huge portion of the human population is holding this idea that they need to be controlled from the outside, for, uh, for their lives to unfold, for, them, for, for themselves to progress, that can act like a sort of like field, like a, a container that makes it very restrictive um, to, to develop and to find those new options. So we do need a fundamental shift in terms of uh, a large enough number of people stepping into the understanding that they do not need outside influence to unfold on their path. Um, so, it's in, I guess my understanding is that people taking responsibility for their path means identifying the places in your life where you feel uh, you have relied on external influences. So I think that uh, I think that dispelling this from the collective and finding this in our own psychology and removing that belief system, uh, it will it will sort of uh, dissolve one of the major obstacles that then will reveal more options for us because it's such a fundamental trap that exists on this planet. I hope that helps. Yes. Hello. Yes. Great. Hello, Rob. Can you just make that reply to him really quick? You're correct. <laughs> that was the best. Hey, who in here is not completely blown away by that last presentation? Man, and I'm not just saying that, like, holy cow. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody who missed that lecture is going to be, they got to go back and watch it. So thank you so much, Simon. Give it up for Simon, everybody. Hey everybody, we're back live with Simon Essler after that amazing presentation. Man, mind blown. Thanks. I had no idea you were so well studied in all of these things. Next time I need someone to talk to, I'm going to give you a call. Anytime, brother. Yeah, anytime. That's awesome. Yeah. So hey, we've got, we, first of all, I just want you to let you know that there was so much love for you on that live stream. So oh, many people you. that just were like, I need to watch this again. This is amazing. Thank you so much. And wow. there was a lot of questions. So I'm going to ask you some of the questions that some people posted, okay? okay yeah. So one was, how do we know, it? this is from Katrina on the live stream, by the way, how do we know if a divine message is coming from a source of love and light, or if it is a subtle influence from a negative source, such as the Dracos? Mm, that's an excellent question. So sure. uh, I think one of the important things to do is to be focused on uh, spiritual practices that uh, give us access to subtlety. So that means learning to become subtle yourself, learning to move into subtle states so that we can become familiar with it. And as Matthew Mornian pointed out in the survey that I did uh, with him, you know, he always looks for this subtle frequency of truth, that that does have a tangible thing that you can get used to. And uh, there's a teacher that I've worked with named uh, Luhan Mattis, and he says that uh, when subtlety becomes substance, wisdom arises, which my understanding is that when we learn to sense the subtle uh, to the point where it's visceral and very clear to us, then we can start to look through those influences and really suss out what is what. That's awesome. 
So, okay, here's another question from Sarah Lawrence. Can you speak to narcissism as a consciousness attack tool? I started to channel a book about it and stopped because all I saw were Dracos and Greys creating an energetic setup, even from the Lumerian age. Resonate so much with your talk. Thank you, Simon. Hmm, okay, I, I want to yep. read this again. It's an interesting question. Oh, as an attack tool. Yes, yes, very interesting. So I think there's definitely uh, there's definitely an influence trying to push people in that direction. And, uh, you know, the, the Dracos and the Greys, uh, they're very good at uh, targeting people with what uh, is going to impact them in a specific way. And that comes from that awareness. So it's just about where a specific individual is at and if that tool is going to be effective. Okay, next question is from Lisa Cecina. Hope I got that right. What is the best way to fight in these subtle realms the negative influence is trying to manipulate us there? Mm. My personal experience with that is learning to become deeply, deeply silent. That we, we don't want to go in with a sense of internal dialogue, with mental chatter. That to go in and to hold these spaces with uh, deep, silent consciousness, uh, that's one of the most powerful things we can do. Because when we aren't chattering internally, uh, we're much less susceptible to manipulation. So when you're in a silent state, then uh, you're much more sovereign and your integrity is in place. So that's my personal practice, is I try to bring more and more conscious human silence into these realms like I'm cleaning them up and purifying them. Awesome. Okay, a couple more. I kind of want to get through these because these are awesome. If Draco serves the purpose of introducing fear to help us and other positive species evolve and expand our consciousness and awareness, who then introduces good and positivity to the Dracos and have them evolve and experience being good, positive, and service to others? And why has that not happened ages ago? This is by Robert Hintz. Well, my understanding is that we, we are the opportunity to create windows for those beings to evolve positively. Now, uh, even in our community, there's still a lot of like uh, anger and negativity and sort of hatred towards these beings. But if we learn to hold a space where it's possible for a being like that to choose the positive path, then I believe those opportunities arise. But I think it's uncommon because planets get stuck in a sort of survival mentality. It's uncommon for them to be on a planet where that space is being held for them. Gotcha. One last question from Victor Collett. I'm a little bit confused on the astral plane free will distortion. Can some entities just take our dreams away in a sense? Mm. Uh, well, this is to do with the development of the astral body. So in terms of dreaming, uh, I don't think anything's being taken. I think it's the same principles in play. I think uh, the idea is that um, there's aspects to your astral existence that need to be better understood. Your awareness of them needs to be refined. And so there might be specific encounters that, uh, that uh, catalyze wisdom specific to that realm and specific to your astral existence. Simon, thank you so much, man. And just in a couple minutes, Simon's going to be back on stage and he's going to be moderating a small panel with Cliff Mahuti and um, David Lone Bear Cinepass. And David Lone Bear Cinepass. So yeah. stay tuned, you guys. War. We are surrounded by it every day. Overt violence right down to the subtlest expressions of spiritual, psychological, and biological warfare. Does war represent a life lesson that humanity has been stuck repeating for eons of time? Is it possible that the karma of wars playing out on Earth right now has galactic origins? Can we finally grow beyond this lesson as a species? Season one of this series will explore the metaphysics of warfare. Through the lens of a variety of spiritual teachings, old and new, we'll get to the heart of this ancient mystery. Join me in exploring and understanding the true role of war in our lives. I'm your host, Simon Esler. And welcome to Worlds Within, only on edgeofwonder.tv.